Hi everyone, welcome to the Tony Tan Show and Podcast. Today, I'm very excited to share with you an amazing technology. And this is called Graph Databases. It harnesses the power of data to change the way we work, play, and live. But what exactly is Graph Databases? And how does it go about to change the way we work, play, and live? To answer these two fundamental questions, we invited in two very distinguished guests with us for our podcast today. First of all, we'd like to welcome Serene King, Managing Director of Tiger Graph. She's also the commercial head for commercial sales in Tiger Graph as well. Serene King has been a management for past companies ranging from Symantec to Proofpoint and Automation Anywhere. So we are very honored to have her with us today to share with us her insights. The other guest that we have is Clement. Clement is a data scientist and a solution architect for Tiger Graph. Clement lives, eats, sleeps data. He's been practicing data for the last seven plus years with a host of financial and government institutions. And he has served with his knowledge on companies like DBS and CSIT. So today, both Serene King and Clement are coming to our show and share with us their vast knowledge on this exciting emerging technology. So thank you very much, Serene and uh, Clement, for joining us today. We are very, very excited uh, to talk to you, to have you on our show. Simply because they, everybody's wondering about this thing called graph, right? And what is it all about? Why is it changing the way we live, work and play? Right? We want to understand more about this groundbreaking technology. But first off, I would like to talk about where we were in the last two years with COVID. You know, I think we have a lot of organizations pivoted to go digital. And I would think that it has been very, very successful. And there are so many interesting things and teams that are coming to play today. Right? I think in terms of pivoting, a lot of organizations are clearly benefiting from it. But we are also seeing some very interesting challenges with this uh, digitization that's going on. Right? Like the recent fraud cases, SMS fraud cases with our biggest banks. Uh, we have nickel trading frauds that's on the rise. Scams are everywhere today. Uh, and also we have ch uh, the technologies like the metaverse that's coming out. With it's related blockchain, uh, crypto games and things like that. So the landscape in the last two years has totally, utterly changed. I, I, I would like to think that it's for the better. So what do you think about, you know, some of these uh, 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 initiatives and some of this digitization that's going on? Uh, where do you see some of these um, possibilities and where do you see some of these challenges uh, as a nation, as like Singapore, as we embark on all these programs? You know, what, what's your take about uh, these changes? Maybe Clement, you could uh, show, share with us some of your insights. Yeah, I think you touched on a lot of things here. Um, obviously, COVID has accelerated the whole uh, digitization, mm. you know, this whole wave. So a lot of organizations, you know, I, I came from a bank background. Last time, you know, we doing production, we had to be in the production room. But right now, when I check with my ex-colleagues, they are actually working from home, right? Really uh, operating the environment, everything from home. And really so much has changed since, since then. And, um, and you're right, because there are so many... Um, challenges as well right like with cyber security and everything coming into picture all sorts of uh, different uh, variations of data that's coming in how do we then handle that you know and at scale mm -hmm. as we have more and more data that's coming in um, how do we then handle that very properly and securely yeah yeah so we're, we're talking about on this track about cyber security and fraud <laughs> You know, it's really interesting that we have spent so much money, millions and millions of dollars, right? Uh, banks and insurance, precisely to control this situation. But what is it that we are spending so much money? Why are we still seeing this fraud making headlines on the newspaper every day? Yeah. Is it simply because the technology that we use is not good enough? Or maybe, uh, you know, we have not invested enough or we are waiting for a new mm. evolutionary type of technology that maybe give us a better chance in controlling some of these uh, challenges that we are seeing every day? Well, I think first of all is that there is more and more people working from home. So actually, um, that is already one big source of vulnerability that we are, we are and, um, facing. Right? So, um, and also the threat actors are getting smarter and smarter um, and uh, they making use of very, very creative, their own creative juices, right, to kind of scam you, scam calls, uh, even SMSs and whatnot, right? So I think it's, it's not just, um, I think the technology that uh, so far that is um, in the market is also um, trying to keep up with all these changes, right? So how um, 
do we then uh, uh, have a technology mm. you know that is able to keep up with all these challenges uh, along the way yeah. yeah and these are really serious challenges that we are seeing uh, every day right yeah I mean, more exactly. and more people are getting scammed you know yeah. they're making the news for the wrong reasons right and of course you know it's this cyber security and this scam and this fraud thing is really a big challenge that we are seeing hand in hand with mm. increased digitization. I think the other thing that we are also looking at that's really, really interesting is on the supply chain, right? Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Today, I think we are facing a scarcity of everything, right? Ah. Ironic. We have not enough HDB flats to be sold. We have uh, jewelry, <laughs> jewel- jewelers are not taking orders, even have the money, yeah. right? Uh, even second hand car dealers do not have enough cars, and some of the cars that shipped do not have start, stop. Our capabilities because of a sh- shortage of chips worldwide. Mm-hmm. Right? Why also we are very curious like with all this m- money that's invested in ERP systems, supply chain optimization, just in time manufacturing, you know, why are we still having supply chain issues? Mm. Uh, is, there a, is there a possibility that there's technologies that's around the corner that gives us a better chance of uh, predicting and controlling and seeing where are some of these bottlenecks so that we are able to prevent these issues in the future? you want me to take that? Oh, I have one for you, sir, coming just right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, for the COVID situation, it really um, opened up this whole c- can of uh, worms, so to speak, right? <laughs> that uh, um, in this whole supply chain model, right? I mean, it's not that it's imperfect or anything, but uh, I think they didn't quite prepare uh, for something like that so major that was happening with the pandemic, right? So um, I think that's one of the reasons. I think secondly is that um, ERP systems and all those things, um, I would say is, is they have their own useful place, right? But um, how do we, you know, connect different data from different sources with ERP being one of them? And then how do we um, have all this unstructured data that we see so often on the yeah. net? How mm-hmm. do you then connect everything together? And we are talking about, you know, not just your supply data, you also have your customer data. How do you overlay all these different kinds of mm-hmm. data together? Mm-hmm. Um, and of course you have your uh, parts data and all those things, right. right? So how do we connect all these disparate data sets together uh, to then give you a good overview, a unified view to then uh, run whatever algorithms that you want to then detect, right? Say, um, do some impact analysis. What happens if one part of your, um, let's say, uh, let's take a car for example, right? What happens if a windscreen wiper or something gets um, out of stock, right? right? How do you handle that? You can't ship a car without that, right? So it's really about balancing the whole supply and demand. Those chain along the way yeah yeah and i think we are alluding to a technology that <laughs> might be able to come into play to solve exactly. some of these traditional disruptive issues that we are seeing very soon but i'll come back to that yeah clement now the other thing that i'm really really excited about is this growth of the metaverse and its correlated technologies along blockchain cryptocurrencies and crypto games right i think this is something that's that has seen a lot of uh, popular take up in the last two years uh, in the market so, Serene, I know that you have been uh, exposed to a lot of these uh, crypto players. You've been talking to crypto leaders in the last one and a half years uh, since you're with Tiger Graph, right? I would like to understand what's your take about uh, Metaverse and all these technologies that we are talking about. Because earlier we talked about scams and those are most more traditional scams, right? In terms of uh, scams that we are already familiar with. But we also see that with the growth of these crypto technologies, Metaverse technologies, this is going to be a very right place for scams to take place. Right, uh, for people to rug pull or whatever, there's so many ways for people to manipulate uh, and, and make a quick buck uh, in these uh. unregulated uh, markets. How do you see, uh, you know, technologies playing a big part in helping in safeguarding our interests as we go into this world of metaverse that is so new to most of the people who are listening uh, to this show? Mm. First and foremost, you heard of this phrase that says, uh, "Water, water everywhere." but not a single drop to drink. Okay. So essentially that is the state with lots of how data is being stored and classified nowadays. So it's almost like the Garanguni world of uh, data. There's data everywhere in any organizations, but without having a membrane or a schema to pull, pull these data into a single um, you know, insights view, it is 
virtually impossible to make any sense and take any meaningful actions for that. So, you know, the kind of technologies that is there to address like very specific problems is already there. I mean, in cybersecurity, in supply chain, in banking, in metaverse, in blockchains, they're already there. And they're purpose and custom built to address specific solutions here. I think that what is um, right for picking is really one, one overarching, which is an overused word, but it is a single pain, a single main brain of behavioral analytics to understand what all these data interactions are doing to figure out the non-obvious relationship between different elements within a schema. So to put that in context with the blockchain world, now you know everybody knows what KYC is, which is know your customer. Um, in blockchain, you have a KYT, which is know your transaction. And that is down to a very, very, very uh, fine granularity itself. Um, well, I guess a traditional way of analyzing uh, fraud, right, is you can analyze per wallet, per transaction. And any platform, frankly, can do that. But how about analyzing in scale, which means that you're analyzing clusters of wallet, traversing between different platforms mm. itself. Now, that is not something that has a ready-made solution to do so. But that is definitely something that's coming out. Because there are many regulations coming up. In fact, just yesterday, US just uh, made one announcement that they are setting up and they are looking into coming up with the policies that govern the crypto world, the use of uh, you know blockchain, and also what are the kind of frauds, crypto frauds. We are so used to saying the word cyber fraud, but now it's crypto frauds yes. that's happening mm -hmm. over there, right? Because it's a parallel universe in a way where things are getting shifted. You know, we have the traditional swift transactions over the banking protocol, yes. but people are exploring how do you use blockchain as a protocol, not to take over, but to augment that and potentially to see whether there's an alternative way of doing things here first. So along with that, um, an organization has to look into what are the data sets that they have inside and how can they pull it together in a way that makes sense for meaningful actions. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I, can, I can understand, right? Mm. Because personally, I have five crypto wallets myself. Yeah. So can you imagine you multiply by the number of crypto uh, uh, yeah, users out there? Correct. Right, across <laughs> the different networks in the blockchain, it is a very, very complex environment. Absolutely. Right? And, and yeah. it's absolutely uh, mind-boggling. How do you make sense? and tie all these different uh, points together to give you a complete visibility. And a lot of times, right, you're absolutely right, is to... The information, the data, is actually in front of you. But you can't see it because they're not presented in a way for you to make that connection. So the operative here, it, word here really is the find the non-obvious relation. But the relationship is there already. Mm. And because in, you know, graph technologies, we store not just uh, the, the, the attributes about a certain now itself. We store the relationship between different elements explicitly in a schema. Therefore, it is easy to look at the relationship between different elements in a context that you would never have thought of before. So the term that we use is always we surface patterns. And these patterns could tell you a narrative, could tell you a story. Now, really, really interesting. I want to catch you on the last uh, sentences that you talk about, about this graph. So earlier, we, have, we spoke about you know, the benefits of digitization that I think everybody knows the great benefits that uh, helped us through these two difficult years. But the challenges that came out from, whether from a cyber uh, security perspective, from a fraud perspective, from a supply chain perspective, and how do you regulate and manage uh, technologies in the metaverse like blockchain and crypto, are some of these new challenges that we are now looking at how to solve this so that we are able to accelerate and, and, and grow together with all this amazing technology. Mm. So I, I hear in the last 10 over minutes that there's this hint of something that's round the corner, right? And I want to get to understand what is this all about. Now, I've been hearing a lot about it and I think there's this word called graph, mm. right? My understanding of graph, uh, to be very honest, is quite... Uh, childish graph, you know. But I, I know that the graph that we are talking about is very, very different. Maybe Clement, you could give us a bit of insight. What is graph? What exactly are we talking about here? Yeah, so I think 
it's a very good question, right? Like, what is graph? I think a lot of people is still very, very new to them. So essentially, graph is different from the kind of graph that we know um, when we were growing up, right? Uh, say, like maybe in Excel, you know, those bar charts or line charts, right? Those are actually, yes, they are graphs, but they are two-dimensional. So what we are talking about here about graph is a three-dimensional kind of uh, graph. Mm. So what essentially, it's um, having relationships between uh, entities. So for example, you and me is talking about a social graph, right? So how, how are you related, right? Yeah, so we can draw a line between us, um, you, Tony, Serene, and me, right? So then that in a way is already uh, um, uh, trying to uh, have that relationship between different entities, right? So, and we are not just talking about people here, but how about say, um, um, like maybe the organization that we work in and all those things, right? We all these can all be connected together as a different set of entities. Mm. Yeah. So that is the graph essentially that we we are talking about. Yeah. yeah. Just to add on to what Clement is saying, right? Um, for the longest time, people take insights from predetermined data sets, mm. predetermined data sets. And the way this data are stored in, is in rows and columns. So when people talk about the word database, that's the first image that comes yeah. up, rows and columns, exactly. an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, and, uh, but very few people know that there is a different, radically different way of storing data. It's almost like you know the neurons and the synapse in your brain. Synapse is the one that connects the neurons. Mm. Neurons is the entities that Clement is just describing. Now, with a view like that and with the connections explicitly stated out in a schema, you will be able to make that inference very, very fast because the value of a graph database tells a story. And the human brain processes pictures, processes visuals, Mm -hmm. a lot much faster when you're just looking at rows of data itself, right? Amazing. So, so mm. can I ask this question? Um, we're not just talking about just data, data, right? We're not, uh, as in not just about um, information that's shared between uh, people connection. We're also talking about devices as well, right? We can yeah. bring devices in exactly. and in context so that we can enrich that data. And, and there's so, something that's so interesting that Serene just brought it up that I'm quite fascinated because I myself, I really enjoyed uh, artificial intelligence. And what you spoke about is that, you know, in artificial intelligence, we always wanted the, the holy grail is to make sure that we get as close to the human mind as possible. So we have things that called deep neural networks that's mm. modeled after the brain yeah. that unleash a lot of new capabilities in artificial intelligence today that yeah. lives and bounds. But now you're saying that you're taking it to another dimension. Yeah. You're saying that we are able to visualize data as in how the brain looks at information in a contextual way, right? Because last time it was two dimension, but now we visualize it and yeah. co contextualize it so that we are able to get more information at a faster, faster rate, yeah. right? With greater volumes, yeah. right? Is that essentially what we're talking about? It's like a graph, uh, a graph is kind of like a cousin to the neural networks well, that like AI a is doing. It's like a graph CNN. Ah, I graph see, Graph convolutional see. neural network. So that's oh. something that just <laughs> that's very it. very yeah. interesting right yeah. so now we are seeing technology that's very map is very close to mapping how the human uh, brain functions i'll give you a, a, another way to look at it so um when somebody is cooking up a story you will see that there's a little bit of lag at every stage because the mind is thinking of okay what i'm going to say next i better memorize this part so that it correlates back to the future narrative of where this story is going to go to but if I'm drawing a memory, if I'm like leaning on something that happened and I'm narrating the truth from that, it's a lot faster. You take the analogy and apply it to a graph database. Yeah. Again, because the relationship between the entities are explicitly stated out, the way that this data is processed is so much faster. So that's why you are getting insights from non-predeterministic, uh, predetermined data in almost a real time. So because a lot mm. of times, right, you may get the information you want, but not in the time that you want it. The mm. right information one year later is of no use. It's as bad as having wrong information here. So I guess that the big, you know, the big um, paradigm shift in how we, how we do things is how we look at things. We are not adding to the, again, I like to use the word, the Garanguni Sea of data out there. We love Garanguni Seas of data because to us, they are the disparate data assets that we draw 
information we draw data from and have a human in the loop to create that smart schema yeah, for yeah. the people to make quick decisions in real time based mm. on the insights and based on now they see relations between, you know, between entities and they form a narrative mm. that justifies the actions. Yeah. So what, what you're telling me, if I, I, if I going to uh, see whether I understand this correctly, we are bringing the, the ability to understand contextual information Co like what we have in a human yeah, brain, exactly. but we are Im amplifying like, like a thousand times in Absolutely. terms of volume exactly. so that we have a greater visibility of all the data points that's going on. Well, mm. that's really mind boggling. Absolutely. The word that you use, right, hits the new context. It, you know, you can have data classified and stored in different ways. Uh, you can stack it, you can sort it and everything. But data in context gives you the direction to make decisions that you otherwise would not have made it to, yeah. right? Yeah. And that spans across different industries. Just now you were asking about, you know, in the, in the metaverse, in blockchains, in supply chains, in fraud analysis, in surfacing fraud patterns and everything. So you can see that how this how this technology by being able to surface out these different patterns tells you a story mm. that you know any investigator any logistics planner would not have thought of otherwise yeah yeah As, I, can, I can really understand it now that you explained it, it, it this way uh, can you imagine if you are e-commerce company or you are gojek or you are a grab you have millions of live transactions every day across these super apps and you want to find frauds you know in such a key uh, touch key volume of transactions coming out you really need a real uh, real time uh, kind of technology that's able to scale at speed to solve some of these real problems fast right. and just now you mentioned a little bit about connection so i hear a lot about connected data i hear a lot about uh, amplifying the, the the power of the connected data right are you, are we alluding that this when we uh, connect the data together as like what you're talking contextual uh, that 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 means we are now unleashing the power of connected data. What what this this data can give us in that sense? Shall I? Please. Yeah, go ahead. I think that um, data that is not in context will drive actions in a certain direction. And data not in context doesn't mean that they're the wrong data, but they do not tell you a story. They mm -hmm. did not help you form a decision uh, that you can make fast to you know buy a certain item stock out a certain item have a surplus and decide where do you direct that surplus to and that's obviously a nod towards the SEM mm. the supply chain management area um, data that is not in context does not tell you the relationship between um, you know a person who is trying to round trip money and uh, trying to go through multiple layers of synthetic money laundering accounts to find a way to do a cash out because a lot of times, right, um, you get lost after a second or third, you know, separation uh, degree of separation, right? And the trail goes, you know, go, go goes cold. Cold, go cold, like yeah. those go, uh, cold cases yes, and everything. Yes. But having a graph, right, allows you to go to that like 12, 20, 30, 40, 50 different deep level hops. It's like, it's like going to an Inception movie, yeah. but being able to be able to extricate yourself out in real time, right? is actually really equivalent to that from a science fiction perspective. Yeah. But it's true right now because this is a technology that allows you to understand why things happen in what context and see that, you know, multiple hop, multiple degrees of uh, separation relationship between someone and something that is connected by another person that you never thought was actually connected or related in your wider stream. You know, Serene, when you tell me yeah. things like that, it reminds me of the Hollywood movies that I'm watching all the time. Oh, it sounds see. very <laughs> familiar to those criminal <laughs> bots, investigation bots that we are talking about. That is There's so many <laughs> photos, <laughs> maps, rubber bands, pins all over the place. I don't know what the rubber band is doing. Yeah, there. it's like it's like drawing, drawing relationships, right? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, that's yeah. exactly what we are talking about here, right? We are exactly. creating that, but in real time, uh, real life uh, situation across multiple use cases for enterprises. Absolutely. And one of the use cases in you know, law enforcement, right? I mean, uh, without going too much into the details, they were asking us about cartel logy. So cartel is like, okay, which three, you know, organizations are, you know, like co co corroborating together for certain things? Why do they always appear in a trial, in a group and everything? Why do they appear in, in trials in areas where I'm surprised to see them there? Mm -hmm. Whole idea of graph is to show, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, my gosh. Oh, what is it doing here? Right. 
So I guess that from a movie perspective, yes, it's true. It is like a very scaled out and enterprise and solid version of the, you know, the, the I, I wanted to say mood board, but I guess that's not, <laughs> the, not the right word for it. The drawing board. The forensic board. <laughs> yeah, yes. the forensic yeah, it's board. like the cops is in the middle yeah. who are linked to it. And then, you know, you look at the characters in the movie, there's, oh, there's a relationship between mm. the, you know, always the husband and the victim. Yeah, but I mean, this is so revolutionary, this, this technology. We should have this technology, you know, years back. But is Graph new? Is it something that is just uh, uh, invented like yesterday? Or has it been... What's the history of this technology? No, Maybe I, Clement, think, you can yeah, share I think it's been around uh, 20 years ago, I think. You oh, know, much longer. I think it's oh, only when more. the white colour wigs. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, since the really the olden times, right? Yeah. So like, that's why like in the CSI uh, movies and the dramas, they are already doing it. But right now, it's just at scale. And this technology uh, has been maturing in the last 20 years. Mm. Um, and why it has not been, um, you know, as popular as say the RDBMS that we all know, like the normal SQL databases, it, it's because of the scale. No one else has done a graph database at the scale that we are doing right now. Yeah, which is why um, it has not kind of exploded right yet. But that's why now this is the good time to, you know, really utilize such uh, amazing graph technology like Tiger Graph to be able to then uh, not only connect uh, these parrot data sets together, but then also to um, run uh, uh, at scale kind of analysis, um, deep link analytics like what, you know, Serene was uh, mentioning about earlier on to then surface to the, the business users, you know, and it's already straight away it's explainable. Yeah. You can see, okay, why is this a fraud? case mm. right this person is linked to this uh you know credit card stolen mm. credit card and a phone and all those things straight away it tells a good story and um and it also helps you to then report it to the authorities mm. right okay what's happening on a day by day basis your time series analysis and all those things yeah yeah i, I see another parallel here earlier we talked about uh you know neural networks and the ability to contextualize information you know that models of the, the brain and now we are talking about the maturi maturity of graph technology. It's, it's, it's very, very suspiciously parallel to artificial intelligence. Would you say that the growth of digitization and the growth of data sets and, and all this information allows us to now mature this tech because we have all the foundations that was missing in the last 20 years? Yeah, I think that is the first thing with the big growth of data, with big data and all. Um, but I think the second thing is also the the... the computation power right the maturity of that because you need to have this at scale to be able to run all this in different kinds of use cases right yeah so i would think it's a two-pronged thing la. so it's a big data as well as uh like computation and storage has become uh, cheaper yeah mm. really interesting so now i want to bring this conversation closer to home we talk about hollywood la. we went you know went all over the world let's come back to singapore you, we know that we are trying to move ahead as a smart nation uh, and Singapore is very, way ahead in certain technologies like creating digital twins. I don't ex exactly understand what's digital twins. I read about it, but I want to be educated. A lot of our audience want to understand what is digital twins, right? Because they find that this is going to be very, a very exciting area that is going to be very big in the near future. Could you give us some context to the meaning of digital twins? I think, like in layman terms, a digital twin is a replica, a digital replica of uh, something physical. It can be your mark, it can be your mic, it can be, you know, your, your laptop, right? So um, really having that uh, 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 digital replica um, online. And why is that uh, so exciting and it's, it's, it's so powerful is because imagine you can then uh, say maybe before you release a camera, you can then do all the high level testings and in real world scenarios in a virtual uh, land, right? So that's where uh, digital twin can um, be very, very important for, for us, you know, even in back home in Singapore uh, to do city planning and urban planning and all those sort of things, yeah. Amazing. So would you say that digital twin is like a kind of a, the kind of uh, uh, simulation that we have in the past, but it's on steroids. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's real, new, real time with huge volume of data for data modeling. And I understand you can apply machine learning onto this uh, 
digital twins as well, right? Definitely, definitely. With the all the different parameters, I can then you know extract the different features, and then I can pump it into my machine learning model, and you know do further analysis, do further training, and do further uh, scenario what if kind of uh, uh, analysis. Yeah, when this thing fails, um, what is going to happen to my downstream? Right, all these things are all very, very natural in this whole digital mm. twin uh, space. Yeah, and if you look at smart nations, you know there is so many things that's tied to a smart nations. You talk about the power grid, mm. you talk about uh, green energy, you, you know, you talk about building designs. The parameter and the volume of data is tremendous, and they are all interconnected and they're contextual. It sounds like this is a great opportunity for graph technology. In fact, the way you explain it, I think graph is made for digital twins. Would you say so? I exactly so, absolutely, because. Really, I think we were talking on the way here. Digital twin is really the natural use case for graph. Yeah, not only connected data, it's also contextualization that we just, we talk about for, for, for quite a lot of times, um, you know, for the past 10, 20 minutes, right? So, yeah. I think a lot of this also is in terms of the, you know, the, the ferocity of data gushing in from, you know, now you, there's, now, there is not just a way, but there is a context of where you collect this data from, in what format. Mm. And you're going to come in from all sorts of different ways, right? From elevator, you know, data going up and down, how fast, what are the kind of people, smart lives and everything. Yeah. And how do you pull them all together in a way that makes sense? So yeah, sure, you can store the data in uh, CSV formats, rows and columns, but that's just not going to make a lot of sense to a lot of different people. Um, but the quick and easy way to really get an out, outcome, and the outcome is an action, a decision of how you're going to save more power, for example, how mm. you're going to move towards your green mark, for example, is really looking at all this data in the right context and how they correlate to each other. Mm, how there does we go again, context and correlation. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Recurring theme there, yes. Yeah, and that is how a human brain really thinks, mm. right? You tell me a bunch of numbers, I got to take time to figure out and yeah. there'll be a lot of questions I maybe move into inaction because I don't really understand the context. So even in our daily speech, we say, tell me the context. I mean, that's because we want to take an action based on the data that we have in the right setting. Mm. Yeah, so... Digi digital twin, like what Clement says, is a digital replica of our real world itself, right? But all that and all that data is going to go somewhere, and it fits into all the different data swarms, data pools, data garangonis, data lakes, data yeah. marts, and data odd, whatever you have it. The right? buckets, the data buckets, the buckets, basically. you know, the cups, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. things like that, yeah. right? Um, I think the one ring that rules them all, or the one view that gives the right context, mm -hmm. would be the the you know the, a, a a smart schema. So it doesn't mean that you ingest all this raw data into a, a graph a schema. That would be not the smartest thing to do. The human must still be in the loop because the human uh, could be a data scientist or data engineer or data architect. Needs to know what are the ingredients to put into this schema. What are the data that you need to pump in to answer those difficult questions that people always have but may not have surfaced because they don't think that it was possible to answer meaningfully these questions in a way, yeah. right? Yeah. So, S Serene, uh, I have do my some research, like, you know, with my limited knowledge. I understand that some very famous companies are really start using this technology. Could you share some of these famous companies with the audience today who are already on graph? Okay, um, because there are some... Comp uh, and, uh, here's one thing. Um, sometimes we are not able to share the use cases because it's a secret source of a lot of the company to do so. Yeah. But one of our famous customer, right, when we, uh, before we even started in Singapore, is Australia Tax Office. Now, ATO is a customer of Tiger Graph, and, you know, in tax, right, in general, um, not to say that people don't want to pay tax, but the ones that have an inclination or desire not to pay will not be found so easily. They will not be so stupid to you know, let you let themselves be discovered at the at the obvious levels. So, um, tax officers in general, they have tons of you know different contextual, historical, master data, and all these kind of things. Information about entities, about people, individuals, directorships, companies, and you know history of tax payments and all these things here. How do you imagine running through? rows of database doing left and right joints to come up with something meaningful. 
So at that point in time, um, you know, customers like, you know, uh, tax offices, like I mentioned, they wanted to look at a graph technology that will be able to give the context of that data that they already have in place. And it doesn't work alone. It works together with different complementary you know, data vendors that's out there and everything. Everything, you know, the word doesn't, you know, there's no one, you know, one, one solution to solve everything. Yes. Very much like in the cyber world. Say, so I have a cyber security solution. Yeah, what, which one? Which magic solution do you yeah, have, right? There's no silver bullet. There's no silver bullet for this, right? Yes. So graph is the way that uh, uh, organizations such as that look into their wealth of data and make sense of what they already have. You know, this is really interesting. Just what you said, you are talk, showing us how this technology works at scale. Right? Even before we start this session, remember we were talking about Netflix and some of the movies you're watching together. And you were telling me that uh, you know, Netflix and some of our daily lives like Google search and things like that, they are already on graph. Is it true? Yeah, it's true. So, um, in, well, I'll just talk about the most famous graph of all, LinkedIn. That is a network graph, yeah, right? Exactly. That's a so, I social mean, that's like social well. graph as well, right? It's a whole knowledge graph. Yeah, in fact, it's the worst, busiest gossip column. I <laughs> <Right>? see. <laughs> right. Who knows? Oh, who just yeah, changed? Oh, who has moved? So the world is really living on graph technology for the longest time. We are time. living graph database. Yeah, we are. It's, it's just that it's not, it's not well known, right? Yeah. But it's already everywhere. Remember, we are already consuming graph technology on a daily basis. Remember at the very beginning, we said that the graph is a way the human mind thinks. It's going back to that, right? It's very natural and it's very instinctive and it's very, you know, uh, close to how a human mind thinks. That's why it is so powerful in mm. being able to drive actions. Yes. Yeah. So Clement, you just shared with me about some of the use cases and working on the data sets that they already have. It could be some uh, small data sets that they already have, right? So can we start from a mini graph? Is there such thing called a mini graph and go to a more complex graph? No? Sorry for the layman in me. Uh. No problem, no problem. So in fact, we do have all these mini graphs that you are talking about on tgcloud.io, right? Because we have already started... tgcloud.io stands for? Tiger Graph Cloud. Oh, Tiger yeah, Graph Cloud, I see. Correct. Okay, so okay. that's our cloud uh, offering. La. So it's tgcloud.io. Right. You know, straight away, you're, go, you're, you're there. You just, you know, everyone has a Google account now, very easy to just directly sign in. And then from there, there are many solution packs. You know, you want to, you, want to, you know, start with a small graph, fraud, supply chain management, cybersecurity, you name it, we have it, knowledge graph as well. So you can just go there and play around with it. And there's already sample data mm. and queries for you to play around. Yeah. Actually, okay. we have a contest ongoing now, right? Yes, we do. Yeah. So this is called the Million Dollar Challenge. And it's called Million Dollar because... Price money is up to a million dollars. Yeah, exactly. And right. what do you need to do to get this million dollars? Register. Really? Register at the uh, Tiger Graph. Do you need to be like technical to, you know? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, that means I'm out. Uh, no, I mean, uh, it can be a mix, right? Yeah, it can yeah. be a Business partnership, mix. right? Yes. With your tech folks as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You come out with the use case yourself because we don't dictate the world Correct. problem. Correct. The world has a lot of problems. Lot of find problems one, right? Exactly. And find a solution to solve the world problem. Yeah. Right, be the solution. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Remember the business problem that you have to have first before yes. graph, yeah. before the tech can come in, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm just reading this. It seems that uh, you can win up to $250,000 in cash and yeah. make an impact. Wow. Be the okay. solution, not the problem. Exactly. Yeah. Clement will take this offline after this. Uh, huh? we, need to <laughs> we need to find out more about this contest. <laughs> sure, I can uh, send you the link. <laughs> <laughs> so, coming back to service, a uh, point about certification. For our audience out there who are interested to make a shift uh, into becoming a graph engineer, what would be your advice to these people? Well, I think Anyone who has already SQL knowledge can already get started. Even actually, um, business folks like your business analysts are already starting to learn SQL. So this is actually no different. It's SQL-like, right? We have our own query language, which is going to be the standard of the query language for all graph databases out there. Um, and it's really just for you to go on YouTube. We have uh, graph gurus, and that's where you can get acquainted with the language. And um, honestly, this is going to be a big thing for the next 10 years or so. Yeah. And actually, within the database, we also have algorithms inbuilt. Exactly. So they don't really have to... You know, it's like yeah. building Legos, right? Yeah. You don't really have to well, build the individual brick itself. You can just like piece them together right. and 
And it's all open source, right? We have 50 plus algorithms for you to really let your mind run free and just <laughs> copy and paste and uh, edit as you deem fit according yeah. to your business yeah. use case that I was you know, mentioning about just now. You know, I'm smiling because I find the, I find the title Graph Gurus very catchy. It's GG in short. GG. <laughs> <laughs> Good game. <laughs> anyway, so the thing is that uh, I, I think the message is that it's not difficult to go on the graph, right? I think all the materials are out there and all it is, okay. it is readily available. Mm. If you have a will, I, I'm sure that you, it's really for our audience out there who have some technical background to be able to transact and to become a graph engineer. Is that what you're saying? Yes, yeah. totally. Mm. In fact, um, at the tail end of last year, we signed a couple of uh, MOUs, Memorandum of Understandings with uh, AI Singapore as well as mm. NUS. And a lot of these are not like native programmers. It's the you know, post-grad programs and mid-career switch uh, 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 folks like that. And I think for them to pick it up, uh, you, you should have an inclination for doing something like that, to be interested in exploring the data world. Um, more importantly is you have a passion for solving, solving problems. We call it, are you graph ready? But maybe a better term to say it is that, you know, what are the, what are the questions that an enterprise or a company or you have always have, but you didn't think that it was possible to solve it. Mm. Mm. Right, yeah. So my one of my business partners asked me an uh, interesting question that day. He said, can Graf tell me who is the second most dangerous person in a terrorist organization, for example? That is a very good Graf question. Because if you look at the nuances of that, why not the most dangerous? Because everybody probably knows who it is, right? Um, second most dangerous means you have to really think about what are the parameters of what, con what is considered dangerous, uh, time frame wise, the types of activities and where you get those data from and which geographical context. Yeah. So those are the graph ready questions. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Serene and Clement for both of your inputs. I, I think that uh, for listeners who are listening in, uh, they probably get a very good idea about some of the use cases for graph and why this technology, why now? And, and also how to get on board a uh, graph so that we are able to propel our organization forward, you know, to use this, harness this technology for the benefit of everyone. I just want to switch your gear a little bit, right? And ask you a personal question, Serene. What's your favorite science fiction movie? <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> I like The Matrix. Why? <laughs> because it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I like the vision that, it, not I like the vision it posits. I think that it is a very, Real, I think it is a possible, you know, future where we are hurtling down. Um, I like the other one called the Black Mirror as well, because mm. I, I find it very scary. Because oh I think gosh. we are living in the Black Mirror in many sense more than one already. A lot of the and for those who haven't watched the Black Mirror, it's not a plug for that. I mean, it's a quite old show. Um, it is a show on how if you push the limits of the technologies that we have. Uh, what kind of world will we be in? Mm. And how do you use the technology for good and for, for bad? Mm. Technology at the end of the day is an enabler. Once out of the Pandora box, you can't just squeeze it back into the proverbial box itself. But um, you know, along here, it really gives you know, thoughts to how do we use these technologies that we have for good. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think Black Mirror is a very profound series that uh, for audience who have not watched, they should really take a look at it and have a understanding what is the difference between a one, one degree of separation from reality uh, to where the, the Black Mirror world is happening, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. in many sense, we are in the Black Mirror already. Yeah. Right? So, mm. I'm not sure whether should I be uh, excited about that, but thank you for your insights. <laughs> 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 now I have a question for you too, Clement. You're not going to get away from me. Mm. <laughs> if there's one show to recommend people to know a bit more of Graph from a science fiction movie perspective, what movie would that be? <laughs> you have some time, Clement. Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me change the question. Uh -huh. Who's your favourite actor? <laughs> Who's my favourite actor? Wow. Why not actress? <laughs> or actress, <laughs> la, actor or actress. Yeah. And why? Oh, actually, I... I don't think I have a favorite man, but um, I would think uh, <laughs> um, Leonardo DiCaprio. I would think. Ah, yeah. uh, it's the reason not Titanic, right? I mean, what's <laughs> what's the, 
Were you born? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, okay. it's uh, I mean, he really sometimes you know these great actors uh, just look at their eyes. You can tell that you know what is it they are feeling. They are able to convey, it. and it's through a screen, by the way, right? And that is where. Um, you know, great actors like Leonardo DiCaprio actually do excel in. Mm. Yeah, mm. a good point. You know why? Because when I look at your eyes, I can tell that you're ready for graph technology, Clement. Well done. So thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Sorry, and Clement, thank for you. joining the Tony Time Show and podcast today. It was an amazing, amazing episode. And thanks for sharing all your insights and spending your time with us. I'm sure we're going to benefit a lot from it. And we look forward to uh, invite you back for our next series that we can have multiple disciplines in discussing where all this technology is going forward. So thank you one again. Uh, I look forward to see you soon. Pleasure to thank be you. here. Thank, thank you. Thank you for yeah. having us. Bye. Right, good day. Thank you.